Salam everyone. Ready to make them. Just here to be here today. Who has the book? Uh, you just got the book today. You've had it. You've had the book, More Than Masonry. The book I'm talking about is More Than Masonry. You have it too? I mean, you just got your copy today. You too. Uh, you care to, to enlighten us or what you've learned uh, since getting the book? You know, give us some. How has the book helped you? What have you gotten out of the book so far? I've learned that, uh, that, uh, that there is a name that we use, they go out of color, but it is the word issue, and more than that, it is the day, and those are the things that they go out of color. It deals with she the Moorish Empire, she the Moroccan Empire, she the everything, you know. But I like about it because uh, it's a different thing when you read the book. Got this? Got this? Uh, well, uh, she can train it, train it, how to train it. You look at the page, you pay money, but you get that loved one, and that uh, family out of a small skeptic is done. What? Slow.
the European colonization of North, South, Central America, including the Jordan Islands. I have suggested reading The History of the Moorish Empire in Europe, Volumes 1, 2, and 3 by S.T. Scott. The Golden Age of the Moors, edited by Ivan Ray Sertema. It's a, a compilation of 20 articles with a 40-page bibliography. The Discovery of America, an outgrowth of the conquest of the Moors, also unknown. Pulitzer, in his first edition of his newspaper, I can't recall the name of the newspaper out of here in New York, in the 1800s, he had this book as a review in his paper. The Discovery of America and Outgrowth of the Conquest of the Moors. So this goes back to what the Moorish Empire in Europe. And so what I want to do is show the correlation. And what this is, even the title here is showing the correlation of the colonization of the North, Central, South America, and Jordan Islands and the Moorish Empire in Europe. The European, one of my co-workers in the first, this is the first week of school in 2011, September 2011, and I, I was talking to him about my book, and I was working on it in earnest. And he, he asked me, uh, Mr. Bay, how did the Europeans come into world power? By defeating the Moors. I mean, that's, that's not even debatable. Now, he's limited in his research because his scope of history is what he's taught in school. He has a degree in history, all right, degree in history, a BA in history. So his limitation, as this is not taught in the schools here, I, I, uh, if, you, if you talk to anyone who has a BA in history, whether a teacher or whatever, they were clueless to this. Clueless. It's not taught. So the, there's a correlation of the colonization of the Americas that being North, Central, South America, and Ireland, Central America, and the Moorish Empire in Europe. The the constitutions, the modern day constitutions in Europe are derived from Moorish law. Europeans did not develop law and philosophy on their own. Because we don't know the history, we're giving them that credit. So there so those the origin of those constitutions in England, France, the Netherlands, uh, Norway, Sweden, Germany, survive for more. Moore's Law. Who knows the patron saint of Germany? What's, what is the name of the patron saint of all of Germany? Who is the patron saint of all of Germany? St. Maurice, 1100s. He is the patron saint of all of Germany, darker than me. For those who are listening, I am dark skinned. Give your character, not like Wesley Snipes. No, I'm lighter than Wesley Snipes. You was the Wesley Snipes. So those I'm giving you. So let's envision Wesley Snipes. That's the complexion of Saint Maurice. And he is the patron saint of all of Germany. In J. Rogers' book, another book I want to give you, Nature Knows No Color Line, Nature Knows No Color Line by J. A. Rogers. All right? Chapter 6 is titled, The Negro Has More, has more quotation marks, the Negro has more in aristocratic European families. The Negro has more in aristocratic European families. Let me check the form, make sure I... Okay. The Negro has more 
and aristocratic European families. And Jay Rogers presents the coat of arms and family crest of over 100 coat of arms and family crests of aristocratic European families with dark olive moors. He also presents over 50 names derived from more, German, French, Italian, uh, Swedish, Dutch, that are derived from more, M-O-M-U-I-R, M-O-O-R-E, M-O-R-E-N, the Italian form, M-O-H-R, that are derived from more. So we, we need to talk about the Moorish Empire and Europe. If we want to talk about colonization, we, we need to analyze European colonization in this context. So what happens is we are talking about history, action of us. I suggest to you that we don't talk about European colonization without talking about the Moorish Empire in Europe. Here's the, let's look at the title again. The Discovery of America and Outgrowth of the Conquest of the Moors. This is this title. This title is so revealing. Analyze the title. Showing you this a correlation here. Europeans rose to world power by defeating us. This Christopher Columbus didn't know where he was. The Europeans thought the world was flat. They once did, but not at that time period it is. Not in the 1400s they didn't think the world was flat. Not in the 1400s. Not in the 1400s they didn't think that. We educated Europeans, 1300s, 1400s. Cordova was the learning center of all of Europe. Cordova housed the li- 17 libraries in Cordova, and one library housed over 600,000 books. This is important. So this correlation here. So this Christopher Columbus being some dumb idiot, Europe, no, we taught them. They went to Moorish Uni, came to Moorish University. We made education affordable to poor Europeans, teaching astronomy, surgery, horticulture, botany, chemistry. So this European being dumb is full. We educated them. They got a former education by going to Moorish universities in Europe. Seville, Toledo, Cordova. Those from all different parts, southern, southern Italy, southern France, Germany, as I said to you, the patron saint of all Germany, St. Maurice. So this European coming out of nowhere, see what they've done in the textbooks is showing you pictures of these European images. And so you, you're thinking that all of Europe, all of New Europe looked like George Bush and Donald Trump. There was no people in Europe during the 600s, 700s, 800, 900, 1,000, 1,100, 1,200. There was no people in Europe that looked like this, that's his life. Everyone in Europe looked like Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Lie, lie, lie. In fact, those who look like this, that's his were the rulers. That's what they don't want you to know. Don't tell anybody. They were not that we, You notice I don't have 
Moore's president in Europe. So that doesn't convey rulership. I don't have the title, the Moore's president. You don't want to use that title. We're not talking about a president. We're talking about an empire, rulership, structure, government. We didn't have a president in Europe where we just there and, you know, and we are subjects to them and, you know, oh, no, 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 no. The rulers, libraries, universities. So these, when African scholars talk about Moors in Europe or Africans in Europe, they use the word present. They say, oh, yeah, yeah, the Africans in Europe, yeah, they rose to the nobility. Yeah, the Africans in Europe, they were allowed, you know, to rise up in rank. See, that, that conveys the false concept of, oh, Europeans were the rulers, and they allowed us. No, 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 fam. We were the rulers. We allowed them. That's what I'm getting across. They didn't allow us anything. We allowed them to Moore's University. We educated them surgery in the golden age of the Moors. But these African scholars got to get a fight, man. They're conveying it wrong. They don't talk about rulership in Europe. Hell with presence, rulership. The golden in the golden age of the Moors in the back with the bibliography. There's 40 pages of bibliography. Extensive. 30, over 30 medical diseases. Surgery. A lot of surgery was done. Botany. Classification of plants. Zoology. Classification of animals. And what the Europeans did, also, let me put this here. YouTube, this was aired on BBC about 15, 20 years ago. Bethany Hughes, on the YouTube this, when the Moors ruled Europe. She got it right. But she's European. When is African scholars there? Come on, African scholars. We got a European saying this. Come on, African scholars. Bethany Hughes is not called when the Moors were in Europe. The title is not when the Moors were in Europe, when the Moors ruled Europe. By Bethany, B E T T A N Y, Hughes, H U G. H E S. Support. Present rulership. They're not the same. They don't convey the same ideas. Absolutely not. Edward Scoby and Black Botanica doesn't talk like this. Edward Scoby and Black Botanica talked about a presence of Africans in Europe. But Edward Scobie and the Black Botanica doesn't talk about rulership of Africans in Europe. Conveys a different idea. Now, the Moorish Empire in Europe, you have philosophy, where the concepts where the Europeans and what the Europeans also did was translated 
Arabic text, Arabic medical books, Arabic astronomy books, horticulture, and to Latin. They preserved the knowledge in the Latin for this whole, yes, they burned books, but they preserved the knowledge into Latin. They didn't destroy the knowledge. They're not stupid. They preserved it in the translation from Arabic to Latin. Hundreds of thousands of books written by hand. On numerous subjects, as I said, astronomy. And astronomy was a huge study. Not mine, astronomy. With astronomy, you make maps. With astronomy, you navigate, you determine where you are. Longitude, latitude, distance, time. Using that, we use the astrolabe, an astronomical tool of determining where you are. It's the sex, the sextant. So the knowledge of astronomy played a huge role in in Europe. Now focusing on Europe because we're talking about the colonial the colonization. They didn't just come out and there's a there's direct correlation of our rise and their fall. Or our, our, our fall or defeat and their rise. Who were they fighting? And you see and more than masonry, that the Spaniards, the Portuguese, the Dutch, the French, and the English were fighting the Moors. They say black people. These European scholars ain't saying, aren't saying black people. The Moors. Come on, ask the scholars. Farrakhan said in August of 1995, Farrakhan said this, black is used for an atom object, negro for bottle, black shoe. But if you're talking about human being, you use another name. What are those? Farrakhan said that. And guess where I'm going to put that neck on the back cover of Moors and Masonry Part 2. July 1995, Columbus, Ohio. My great man Farrakhan. The only people that they're Moors. And they're not, that they're not black. He said black is used for an animate object. If you're talking about human beings, you use what name? Farrakhan said that. Yes, brother. Another question here. Uh, from my understanding, from um, reading on the noble Jew and a lot of his literature, he accepted that it's going to be clear who's who, right? So mm-hmm. is it... Uh, is it a okay idea to speak that nation of Islam? Is it correct? Or All right, let me, let me, oh. I said a direct quote. I gave a direct quote from a public speech. No, but I but you got it. This is a public speech that Farrakhan gave to over 10,000 people at the Coliseum in, at Columbus, Ohio. A public speech. Few people remember it. Taj and I talked about it for nine months. This was 22 years ago, almost 22 years ago, 21 and a half years ago. I can give. I can quote someone who makes a public speech. That's a direct quote. 
I didn't say Farrakhan's a sellout. I didn't call him any names. I stated a direct quote that can be verified July 1995 at Columbus, Ohio. It can be verified. A direct quote. He said once again that black is used for an animate object and gave an example. Negro sabato, black shoe. Meaning that you use black for an animate object. He sort of said, when you're talking about human beings, you use another name. And gave the name. Oreno. There's nothing wrong with what I just said. That's a direct quote. I will put it on the back cover of Moses Basic Part 2. That can be verified 1995, July, at Columbus, Ohio, three months before the march. It's like I'm quoting him, Robert Davis, professor of Italian Renaissance history, Ohio State University, which I can do. The enslavement of Europeans doesn't fit the general theme of European world conquest and colonization that is central to scholarship on the early modern era. If you heard a Farrakhan speech, hold on, brother, I got you. I got you. You want to have a I got you. I got you. You heard a Farrakhan speech. Whether it was on VHS, back then it was VHS, YouTube, DVD, or you actually there. You can quote Farrakhan. You can take note and quote Farrakhan said this at the date. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't need to call names. So then you get into the name calling, then that's a, you don't need to be pressed person. Then that's a attack. I don't do that. I got it. Let me. All right, there, brother. Yes. Uh, no, I just wanted to say, you know, for the green, you know, I just wanted to mention real quick from my website, you can play on ideas.cc.com. So I put in Facebook a lot, along with a lot of other things that I put on there, you know, reading stuff that, you know, that people don't normally read, you know, unless they go to school and buy books in the bookstore or wherever books are sold that, you know, or, you know, book profits are okay. So that's what I want to say. All right. Go ahead, brother. So, so okay. Um, uh-huh. I just want to know, like, if it's a million individuals under him and his nation of Islam, uh-huh. and he's okay, black people, black people, this. Uh-huh. Aren't we supposed to like enlighten them and change that? Right. By my putting the quote on that, but that's enlightening, brother. Oh, look. All right. Well, I can't, I can't, I can't speak for you, brother. I can't speak for him. I can't speak for him. I can't speak for them. I can't speak for what they're going to do. I can only speak for what I'm going to do. I can't. I can't speak for what he's going to do. I can only speak for what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do is put that quote on the back cover of Moses Part Two. So what I'm going to do, I can only, I can only speak for what I'm going to do, bro. That's so, all. And I'll put in other areas. I can do that. That's enlightenment. That's enlightenment. They see Farrakhan's name. He's well, he's known worldwide. That's a that quote. He clearly saying that black is, is the wrong word to use. And telling you like white words to use. That's enlightenment. How many people do you think remember that quote? Other than me and Taj. You talking about 21 and a half years ago. And Taj and I talked about it for nine months. I mean, we, I don't take away, we talked about it. I mean, everywhere we went, we talked about it. Nine months we talked about it. How many people do you remember the quote? Any other questions, comments? 
All right? Yes. I got you. I got some <laughs> Thank you. All right, so also, and that means you, in the, uh, when the Moors ruled Europe, she interviewed this European historian, male historian, and he said that in the schools that taught about the schools of Spain, in the public schools of Spain, that taught about the Moors, but the, their, the, the way they teach is that the Moors did not have much influence. The impact was, yeah, the Moors were here, but the influence was minimum. See? So they're not even taught the truth <laughs> in the schools in Spain. The children aren't taught the truth in the schools because the Moors' influence was not minimum. All right? She also interviewed a European woman. She was at the woman's house, and it was a room that's half the size of this room. And she had she has on the on the shelves, I mean shelves were full documents and books that was passed down to a family. We're talking about a library passed down to a family. You know how much that worth? That's priceless. Information our influences well I'm saying we're all that. If we don't know the history, we're talking about our rulership in Europe with emirates and caliphs. Now, what I chronicle in more than history part one is our great sea and naval power. African scholars won't even talk about this. I, I was analyzing why, I'm, you know, looking at, you know, Adam and Sertima and Edward Scobie and Manoko Rashidi and Jose Pimiente Bay. Uh, if, you Google, if you were to look at the YouTube by Jose Pimiente Bay, Dr. Jose Pimiente Bay, Ph.D. at Temple University. I think he teaches at Virginia University, Virginia State University in Virginia. So he'll he give a two-hour presentation. You'll see it on YouTube. And in that two-hour presentation, he mentioned, you know, when, you know, as a countermeasure, he'll tell Europeans that, you know, our ancestors had their ancestors, Europeans, in slavery. And it was just suddenly he dealt about for two minutes. That's something should have been the lecture. Or at least 40 minutes of it. That, that's important. That's impressive right there. Ivan Sertima, lecture on YouTube over two hours long. Golden Age of the Moors. The Golden Age of the Moors doesn't talk about Moors' rulership in Europe. The Golden Age of the Moors talks about the contribution the Moors made, but not rulership, not empire. As P. Scott and the Moors' empire, and the and the title of the book, The Moorish Empire in, in Europe, talks about Moorish rulership. But why are these Europeans, Europeans write about Moorish rulership in Europe, but African scholars don't? When African scholars talk about the Moors, it's their contribution, you know, science and mathematics. But what about our 
It's not bullshit. What about the government structure? Khalifa, the Emirates, Emirates. Why not that? In fact, they guess what guess this book is called this book is in the bibliography of the Golden Age of the Moors. The Moorish Empire in Europe is in the bibliography in the Golden Age of the Moors. Of one of the many books that's listed in medical treatises and surgery treatises, architecture and mathematics and botany and chemistry, and philosophy. All right? And of course, those are elements of rulership, but, but here he talks about the government structure. Emirates is E M I R A E M I R T E. In fact, the word admiral. The word admiral comes from the name Emir, which is a title. Emir. E E M I R A M I R Admiral. A D M I R A L. Navy. So I got you. We had tremendous sea power from fourteen ninety two. The 1580, we were at the height of our sea and naval power. 1492 to 1580, the Ottoman Empire was at the height of power, 1300 to 1600. Jeffrey Woodard, Jeffrey Woodard. European historian wrote an article in 2001. I talked about that last time. And he quotes from a book, the Timelon, that all of Europe quaked with fear. Ottoman Empire made all of Europe quake with fear. Linda Cowley, professor of history, at Princeton University, before she had taught at Princeton, she taught at Yale. In the 70s in Yale, she currently teaches at Princeton University, and she is well acclaimed. I mean, she has awards and, and from her peers, acknowledgement, 40 years of teaching. Her book, Britain, Captives, called Captives, main title, subtitle, Britain, Empire, and Britain Empire and the world for 14, from, let's look this up, in the world, so it's like 16, I the year that she focuses on. Well, anyway, she said in the, in the war of 1664, the Moors captured 10,000 Englishmen and women, 10,000. She mentioned that this has been covered up because the Europeans don't want you to know their weakness. Keep in mind that they want want you to know that you had them, you had wars with them, and you defeated them in wars. The Battle of Alpizar in 1578, where we captured 10,000 Portuguese. We, we, we just don't know our history. So this European, Portuguese, and the Spaniards, and the French, and the Dutch, and the English transported 10 million Africans from the continent of Africa and the whole of ship. The African queen kings and queens so were Africans in slavery to the Portuguese and the Spaniards and the French and the Dutch. These the helpless, defenseless the people didn't fight back. The Europeans defeated the Africans. They didn't fight back. Man, these Africans were so kind and they would not lift a smile and hurt anybody. These African people didn't fight back. These powerful, great 
your opinions mighty powerful great your being the spirit of weak African people that's the concept they convey in the writing African scholars do it too African scholars do it too I'm talking about your opinions African scholars do it too but we have no we have no navy we have no ships I mean, you know, all right, so you had your head up, so I want to acknowledge you. And you have yours on? Yes, sir, I do. I want to offer a prehistoric Navy and Marine. I did the whole nine yards. Hey. Well, yes, we did do that. Absolutely. So he, I can't wait. I can't wait. No, no, well, unless you have different ancestors than I do. But we're gonna be gonna I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna move on. Oh my glasses. Oh man, thank you, sister. <laughs> I would have been questions, comments. Anyone else? All right. Ten thousand. Battle of uh, Alcazar seven to fifteen seventy eight. All right. Also war between the Moors and the British in sixteen sixty four. Linda Colley talks about that in her book, Captives. All right? Yes. So, uh, Black Bear is known to the Red Hat Yeah, Red Bear. Red Bear, uh, uh, that's the, the, the Italians named them that. Okay. Yeah, yes. Because they always just been moved. Well, they're going to pick the leg off, I'm just allowed to look at Of course. Yeah, well, yes, because they don't want you to see yourself. Right, of course. Yeah, his um, name. I have his name in the book, and they put the Italian called him Red Bear. Yeah, this, yes. All right. If you look at in Egypt, you have the huge statue where oh this let me put it, I'll put it up here so I can show you. So give me a minute. Give me him. Brother, 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 brother. Please, please. Thank you. Where they have their arms are crossed, and they have the ankh, an ankh in each hand. All right. So since you brought that up, you now got to get me to explain it. All right. The Saint George's Cross, the Saint George's Cross, and the Saint Andrew's Cross. So they call it the British flag. You have the St. George's Cross and the St. Andrew's Cross. All right. You got to make me explain this. Oh, man. Only because he brought it up, and then I didn't, you know, I just didn't, you know, because it's astronomy, brother. Astronomy. All right. Yes. Yeah, I'm just going to, I just need space here, brother. Oh, you have what you have what's called the... The tropical cross, for those who are watching, those are, this is the cross that you used to see on churches. All right? All right, the tropical cross. Well, plus, we have the tropical cross. The, tro- the, the galactic cross is an X. That's the galactic cross. And you have the tropical cross, all right? An asterisk, an asterisk, all right, forms that. St. Andrew's cross, the St. George's cross, they call it the British flag, all right? Where they got this from, all right, equals this. We have the, the union of two, this tropical cross here, and this occurs around this Union here of the tropical cross and the galactic cross occurs about every 1,200 years. All right? It's, it's astronomy. The flags, the flags have ast- are encoded astronomically. They're, they're not just for beauty. It's astronomy, bro. Flag, coin, astronomy. We just we can't read symbolism, that's all. It's sitting in plain sight. 
can't be similar to you. And we keep thinking everything's your opinion. That's your opinion. Your opinion. And we only say that because they have it. It's like they have it on their, they're wearing your headdress like they are, they are in, in, 19, in 2013, and it's in the it's pictures are here, 2013 Shining Parade. I was, I was you streaming it, you know, standing out next to the uh, European woman and her daughter at the time. The, the daughter started, she's about eight, nine years old now. She's about five years, five years old then. And these hundreds of Europeans, all right, parading down the street, wearing our moist dress. And a European girl said, look, mommy, they're wearing the shyness hat. Now, our brothers and sisters, who I love dearly, who are Easter stars and masons in order, they think their prayers belong to the Europeans. Why do they think that? Because they read books written by Europeans. They actually started in 1717 and in London, you know, and so they give them that false, false history. So because they're wearing it doesn't make it theirs. You're only saying it does because they're wearing it. That's it. You don't know the origin of it. Another point I want to make, Renoko Rashidi, which I can quote him, Renoko Rashidi, in July of 2010, at Camden, New Jersey, um, Montu had, Renoko Rashidi had, was coming out of the country, I mean, someone had picked him up from the airport. We were waited a couple, two hours for him. It was at my brother Montu's uh, place, uh, community center, in uh, Yorkshire Square, which was the first time that I met Renoko Rashidi. So during Renoko Rashidi's presentation, he said that more means black. Hmm. More means black, all right? What language? Oh, the word more comes from Greek. It means black. All right, let's talk. Greek is an Indo-European language. So you can't tell me that the origin... Let's just go right into my second part of my presentation, which is dictionary study skills. We'll go right into that. You can't tell me that the origin of more is Greek when Greek is an Indo-European language. Let's break that down. Indo-European language. I want to teach you how to deal with scholarly, all right? That's address it scholarly, not emotionally, scholarly. Indo-European language. Greek is Greek, English, Old English, French, Dutch, German, all right? Latin, Portuguese, Spanish. There are Indo-European languages. What's Indo? Here we go. Indo comes from the Sanskrit, all right, Sindhu, which is a river in that area. And there's a book called, written by Stanley Poole, Medieval India under Mohammedan Rule, 711 to 6, 1764. Medieval India under Mohammedan Rule, 711, 7, 714, to a, uh, 1764. Now, the, the Turks Arabicized under the rulership, Arabicized Sindhu to Hindu. That's Arabicized form. All right? The British, when they controlled the area, they what? Anglicized Hindu to India. So Indo-European language applies Sanskrit 
origin. So you can't tell me, linguistically speaking, that more is derived from the Greek language. When the Greek language is an Indo-European language, the Greek language is derived from what? Sanskrit. See what knowledge does? Taking it to the origin. So more cannot be a Greek speaking origin. No words, no words, no words are Greek in origin. Why? Greek is an Indo-European language. That's what that was. That's what that is. I well, I told him stop, stop here. It's a little simple, not too much for me. Explain where where you where I'm off. Explain where Indo-European language. The language Greek is just like English. Just like Cantonese. No, 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 no. See that's what? The word Indo. I'm giving you the origin of the word Indo. The Europeans, the Europeans created this term. Indo-European language. Now, give me the origin of the word Indo. The word is Sindhu. That's Sanskrit. I gave the book. Medieval India under Mohammedan rule, 714 to 1764, under the rulership of the Turks, they Arabicized this word, Sanskrit word, Sindhu, into the word Hindu. The British, when they took over, anglicized it to India. You clear now? All right. I'm showing you that Greek is derived from Sanskrit. Greek words. So you can't say more is derived from Greek. No words are. That's called the Indo-European family languages. Greek is part of that. English, Old English, Middle English, German, Old High German, Old Middle German, Norse, Swedish, Spanish, Latin, Portuguese, French, Old Norse. All right? So you can't say, what's the origin? Oh, what's the origin of that word? Greek. That's not that's the origin. That's the origin. The scholars are saying that. That the origin is Greek. Not the origin. Let me show you this. So that's how you would deal with that. If someone says, like when Oklahoma City, that more means black. More derived from Greek. More is a Greek word. I'll show you that it's not. That Greek itself, the language itself, survived from Sanskrit. That's where I'm coming from. All right? That's how you do it. So for anyone to challenge me, I have no problem, they have to use linguistics. How would you challenge me? You gotta use like the same. Well, that's not so. That's not a challenge. You can't say, well, that's not so. My daughter, anybody can say that. That's not a challenge, though. You got to show me linguistically. You got to first. You got to show me that Greek is not an Indo-European language. You got to show me that first. I'm not gonna show you that Greek is. You have to show me that Greek is not an Indo-European language. All right. So let me go right into. This goes right into my second part of the presentation, etymology and dictionary study skills. Good me, but in Greek, I live right at the end All right. So I'm not attacking anyone. See, an attack would be 
When Oprah Wash sees a sellout, that's an attack. You don't want to do that. If you give a quote and then break it down, shows that's not an attack. You don't want to attack the sellout. This, that, this, this, this. That's not, that's not, you don't want to do that. Show scholarly. Give a scholarly breakdown. If they say something, put what they said on the board and give a scholarly breakdown. But an attack, you don't want to do that. All right. In dictionaries, we'll have brackets. It's called etymological brackets. And this is an area that we're not taught, and then and I'm going to show you. This is called the entry level meaning the work when you when you have the, where we are limited to a dictionary study skills. You have the numbers, number one, the definition, number two, definition, three, four. That's called the that's called, that's called the entry level meaning. Now. The etymological brackets in modern English dictionaries give us limited information. It only, it doesn't go beyond the Greek. So we, it's limited here because you don't see the Arabic, you don't see the, the Sanskrit, you don't see the uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs, all right? Nothing beyond Greek. You see Latin, all right? Uh, Old English, Middle English. French, all right, Ojai, German, but nothing beyond the Greek. So where do people get that, oh, derived from Greek? See? Is that controlling our minds? They're controlling me because you can't think beyond the connotative meanings that they give you. They're controlling your mind. They don't control my mind. Well, you can think that way. So, you know, if you want to feel good and say that, go right ahead. Go right ahead. If that makes you feel good by saying the Europeans don't control my mind, if you want to feel good by saying that, go ahead. Go ahead. So even with the etymological bracket, there's a control here. Attributing to Greek. Yeah, Greek is the first language. Yeah, Greek is the oldest language. And you would think that if, you know, if you just stay in the etymological brackets here in modern English dictionary. See how they are using social engineering with dictionaries? You have here, you have what's called the true meaning, meaning. True meaning and meaning. What's the difference, Abdullah? I'm glad you asked. An etymologist, I'm going to etymologize, I have Egyptian. Etymology, still doing Egyptian. Etymology, you have semantics. Semantics is spelled, etymology is spelled E T Y. M O L O G Y, semantics itself, you're going to put, you have two meaning, underneath two meaning, you're going to place the word etymology. Directly across the, the term true meaning, you're going to place meaning. The know the word meaning, you're going to place the word semantics, S E M A T I S T S E M A N T I C S. I'm doing this for those who are listening. A etymologist will focus on the origin of the word, its cognates, and its, its cousin in other languages. How that word, how a particular word was transliterated using phonology, which is sound, and morphology. I, 
So a word, for instance, in etymology to do this, we have the Latin pater. In English, it's father. So an etymologist will understand, using understanding phonology and morphology, that the P in Latin transliterates to the F in English. The T in Latin transliterates to the TH in English. All right? So you're looking at the transmutation of a word, the transliteration of a word, its cognates, its other form. Cognates would be a, this would be a cognate. All right? All right? You have here in Dutch, V A D E R, in Dutch. So that's a, those are cognates in other forms. Comparative method, whereas the semanticist will focus on how a word acquire me different meanings over a period of centuries. How a word acquire connotative meanings, meanings over a period of so a semanticist deals with meaning, whereas the etymologist deals with true meaning. So we need to understand the difference between true meaning and meaning. True meaning and meaning. We're caught up with meaning. We're indoctrinated with meaning and not true meaning. What is the true meaning? What is the meaning? I'm talking about connotation. So in the entry-level meanings where you have the numbers, one, two, three, four, so forth, you're looking at meaning and not true meaning. Now, the etymological bracket doesn't go beyond the Greek. This is a limit, limit, this is limited, all right? It would be a good start, but this is even limited with the bracket. There's only fit this here to the Greek connotation, Greek form. So let's look at meaning and true meaning. I'll give you some examples. See here. All right. Slave. Slave. Okay. Well, the meaning, go to the entry level, the meaning of slave is one who is put in servitude. What is the true meaning? All right. It's an Eastern European nationality. An Eastern European nationality, the Baltic states, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, all right, Baltic states, not, doesn't mean, the true meaning is not a people who is held in servitude. That's not the true meaning of the word. Does it mean that now? It never stopped meaning that. So what's, what's been happening through social engineering is that connotations have been given the, have been viewed or been, have been presented to the public as the true meaning. People have nothing to measure it to by. All they know are connotations. Yeah, we're the sinners of slaves. That's all they know. Yeah, but that's what it means now, brother. You got to focus on 2017. You can't deal with that etymology bullshit. You got to focus on 2017. Etymology, boy, you better focus on 2017. This is 2017. We got to focus on the meaning of today. Who, did, who created that paradigm, though? Who said that, though? I want to know who said that. Who created that? That we have. Who stated that we have to just focus on the meaning of the day? And who does that benefit? Remember, 
Got to keep in mind, people, we, not, we have not been ruling for quite some time. We have a subordinate mentality. I mean, as a people, yes, we do. Yes, we do. We have a subordinate mentality. But we have not been ruling. And I can understand that Europeans have a rulership mentality because they've been ruling for a while, so I understand. They have a subordinate mentality. You know, they control it. They control the institutions. They control the jobs. You know? That's the belly. If the students, you know, yeah, when they're taking the SATs and the PSATs and those standardized tests and etymology is not going to help the children. Europeans are controlling the social engineering. And, of course, we just want to get a job, you know. And I, and I understand that because they, the, they control the resources. They control the jobs. They control our land. They use the color of law. I understand that. I understand that. I understand my hundreds of teachers asking me, both European and Asiatic teachers asking me, how is etymology useful, Mr. Bay? I understand that. Mr. Bay, etymology is a waste of time. I understand where they're coming from. All right? I'm working to get us back to rulership. And we can't get back to rulership with using connotation that they created to what? Suppress culture, our history, take color law, cultural status. We can't get to rulership by using connotation. But I understand my co-workers and family members and so forth, they're looking at jobs. I understand that. They got to feed their families. They got to pay mortgages, rents, and I understand that. You already said in order to change the people and change their literature. I was, I think I was criticized, you know, but what changed though? I started gaining respect when I started writing. I'm going to show you the effect of literature, y'all. I'll put out etymology vocabulary. And before I put out the etymology vocabulary, put out the I'm a Rock and Star newspaper back in 2001. Taj and I put that out. And I put, I had an etymology section in the paper. And I started gaining more attention and the teachers. And I put in my book, etymology vocabulary, out in 2006. Literature, now it gives you an area, a, a, a level of respect. Just let me know that Zhu Ali said, no, she's the people. He was right. Zhu Ali knew what he was talking about. All right? More than masonry. Literature, very impactful. All right? So we got to think. Rulership. I gave this lesson in class on Monday, so I'm working on trying to remember some of the things that I, that I said during the, during the class. And teaching you how to think using with language. Color. It's a hide or conceal. The etymology of the word color means to hide or conceal. You see this on forms, race, and ethnicity forms. You see the word color on race and ethnicity forms, birth certificate, application, all right, and birth certificate, color, Race and ethnicity forms. Our people, because due, due to social engineering, truly believe that the word color relates to complexion. They complexion. So what our people think, we got 
This is what people think. This is what our people are. Complexion, skin tone, all right? Pigmentation, all right? Skin pigmentation, skin tone. This is what people think color is, yes. There's an organization called the NAACP, Colored, it's a past participle, Colored People. That's associated for the National of Colored People. We think that we are color people because we think color means complexion, skin tone, social engineering. Color means to hide or conceal. Simulacrum. Deception. Oh, that's not deception. An appearance. Deception. What's an appearance? On the surface... An artificial plant, an alive plant, are placed side by side, and you're—it's not you're at a distance. Let's say we're at this distance of say ten feet, and in my hand I'm hold one hand I have artificial plant, the other hand I have the live plant. Could you tell them apart? The art artificial plant, if you don't touch it or it's not too close to you, appears to be what? Real. Appears to be real. So an appearance doesn't mean real. So color, the height of a seal, relates to deception. A simulacrum appearing to be real, an artifice, counterfeit. Counterfeit, it looks like the real. So it's what? A concealing, it looks like the real, but upon close examination, with the supreme law of the land, the Constitution, it's not real. Are we on that now? All right. So our people think, as I said, that color refers to complexion, skin tone. But this is why, it's through social engineering, y'all, why our people think that they're colored. All right? Question. In other words, yes. <laughs> he's, uh, he, he's he reminded me that yes, I I told him I would talk about that, so uh, I did promise him that. And uh, I wish you had reminded me, man, before I made the change. <laughs> God, I got to do it because I did promise him. He, as soon as he walked in, he told me, hey, Father, I want you to please tell him that there's no sense in European education. Hold on, brother. And so um, because I did forget, and he didn't remind me while I was in that area. All right, so let me, let me go to that real quick. All right, I, I did say on DVD, right, Blog talks this show and this show, in fact, that um, there's no such thing as European education. Let's go back to the Moorish Empire. Hold on, brother. Hold on, hold on brother. I, I see your hand, but I'm going to, I got you. I mean, I, I acknowledge you four or five times already. So, all right. In the Moorish Empire, the book, the Moorish Empire in Europe, the golden age of the Moors, African president of Europe, 
Black Botanica and uh, Black Athena by Frank Snowden. Uh, no, Black Athena by Martin Bunnell. Uh, uh, Blacks in Greece by Frank Snowden. You see, the I said earlier that the Europeans took over. They translated the Arabic medical books and astronomy books and philosophy books from Arabic into to Latin. I said that they preserved, the Europeans preserved the knowledge in the translation. So the curriculum that's taught in further George Jean, George Jean James in the book Stolen Legacy, right on the back, he says that the term Greek philosophy is a misnomer, long, long name, that Greek philosophy is stolen Egyptian philosophy. But what I mean by there's no such thing as European education, that's what I mean. There's no such thing as European education. It's a Moorish education. We're not talking about the false history. I'm talking about false history. Philosophy, music, theory. Uh, well, what they did with the music, let me, I'll do that later. Uh, dance, ballroom dancing. Classical music, uh, medicine, botany. Uh, Colonnades is given credit in his book. Colonnades wrote a book called Natural Selection, 17, not Natural Selection. Um, it was Natural Selection, 1752. And Darwin wrote a book called Natural Selection. He's given credit for classifying plants. Paul Nathan didn't do that. That had already been done. Animals, plants had already been done. There's, you also have the, the libraries of Timbuktu. And hundreds of thousands of manuscripts have been, have been preserved and found. And this knowledge has been carried, passed down. So U Europeans did not develop language of their own and alphabets and music and medicine, your education. You can't go to any schools in the world and get a European education. Once you understand the origin of it, that's what, that's what I mean. Is I'm good, is I'm good on that? Mm -hmm. All right. Because yeah. I, I went into more detail earlier, you know. I just... The word nationality. I might check my time. The word nationality. All right, thank you. In the 1948 United Nations Human Rights Proclamation, Article 15, Section 1 and 2. Section 1, Section Article 15, Section 2 reads, everyone has a right to a name and nationality. Section 2, Article 1, Section, Article 15, Section 2 reads, everyone has the right to change his nationality. Uh, change his nationality. In international law, what's been done is that nationality is interchanged with the word citizenship, as though they have the same meaning, same jurisdiction, same origin. So Article 15, Section 2 of 1948 Rights Proclamation, United Nations, they're giving you a distorted sense of nationality when we, everyone has the right to change their nationality. They're using nationality in the sense of citizenship. That's where the brother up. That's colored. No. Interchanging nationality and citizenship as though they have the same meaning. That's colored. What is the purpose? 
Everything has a purpose. They ain't, they ain't just doing it, just be doing it. They don't send these things, things for nothing. Work like that. What's the purpose? All right. If we accept the color, that nationality and citizenship are interchangeable. We accept the Europeans' plan of maintaining colonization and occupation. I'll give you an example. Let's say we have those in we have English people, French, Dutch, German. Scottish, that relocate, say 100,000 combined, relocate to China. And living in China. So, we're going to apply for Chinese citizenship. I'm going to be a Chinese. I'm now Chinese. Chinese, Chinese citizen, but not Chinese. Chinese citizen of English descent. Chinese citizen of Dutch descent. Chinese citizen of French descent. Chinese citizen of, of Polish descent, but not Chinese. So this is a change in national, because nationality ties to blood, national origin, lineage, descent, consequently. Ancestors, you can't change that. You can't change that. Somebody committed some proof like death right here. All right? Yes, brother. Absolutely. If it gets you to agree to that, take your inheritance. I'm an American. I was born here. Donald Trump said he's an American. Why? Because he was born here. Hillary Clinton said she's American because she was born here. George Bush Sr. and Jr. said they're American because they're born here. And yet those who weren't born here say, I'm American because I'm a, now, through naturalization, I'm an American citizen. I wasn't born here, but I'm now naturalized. And now I'm American. Now I'm an American citizen. I'm an American. Now they still in your birthright. They claim to be Aboriginal, Indigenous, native to the land. But they, they so when Donald Trump, <laughs> he says, "Let's make America great again," and I agree with Donald Trump. But Donald, we already know that's not his intended meaning. We know when Donald Trump said, using President Reagan, former President Reagan's campaign slogan as his campaign slogan, Reagan used that as his campaign slogan. He says, let's make America great again. I agree with you, Donald Trump. Let me press your hand. Donald Trump, don't tell anybody. Are you aware that Mexico is part of America? Um, Donald Trump, don't tell anybody. Are you aware that Mexico is an American state? What war are you talking about? Donald Trump, you said, let's make America great again. Donald Trump, Mexico is an American state. I agree with you, Donald Trump, and that we need to make America great again. Why are you talking about building this wall up? Mexico is an American state. Look it up. The member state of the organization of the American state. See, this is how you come back. Donald Trump don't know what he's talking about. Look this. That's all. Come on, man. A hype emotional bull crap. So that Mexico 
Haiti, Colombia, Cuba, El Salvador, Suriname, the Grenadines, St. Vincent, Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, Argentina, Dominican Republic, Commonwealth of the Belt of Dominica, Cuba, El Salvador, Argentina, all American states. That's a fact, Jack. New Jersey, New York, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, are not American states. There's an organization called the Organization of American States. And Mexico is a member of the Organization of American States. And so Donald Trump, well, brother man, let's make America great again. But we know his descendant meaning what? European. In this area, we know his descendant meaning European. In this part of America, that they falsely call United States, USA, US, all right? And they use America, but um, the name America, it is not all of America. See, they say, well, America, that's not all of America. So they're not totally wrong by calling it America, but it's not complete, though, because you have to go up here, and they didn't call Canon, Canada and Mexico and, you know, the, the uh, um, South America and Central America and, all right, and the Jordan Islands. That's all of that is America. I got you, brother man. I got you. All of that is America, not just the landmass that they falsely call, that the occupiers of Moist Land falsely call U.S., U.S.A., all right? Mexico is a part of America. Mexico is an American state. It's not even debatable. It's not debatable. I guess they're waiting for us to stand up and say that. You're not going to get any arguments. Want to state it and you know and and, and push. It's just once again the lie or the connotation appears to be real and is not challenged. The Americans are not challenging. The Americans who live in inner cities are not challenging this. Because the Americans who live in the city, classified as black, nickel color, African American, Latino, Spanish, Puerto Rican, don't know that they are Americans. Native, Aboriginal, in addition to the land. But they'll be so quick to call George Donald Trump an American, though. See, I'm not an American. I don't want to have nothing to do with no Donald Trump. I'm African. Donald Trump's an American. I don't have nothing to do with no Donald Trump. I ain't no American. I'm African. I don't have nothing to do with no Bill Clinton and Ronald Reagan and George Washington and Donald Trump and us. I'm an African. See that got us? You just say he's American. You just see. And I ain't challenging him. See that false history? See how that false history is? That false history is powerful, boy. If you came on some bullcrap slaveship story, be a. Yes. Native and indigenous, because our people are twisted and thinking we're we're Indian too, Native Americans. I gave you the etymology for Indian. I gave you the etymology for Indian. Sindhu, Sanskrit, Hindu, Arabic, nice, Indian. All right? All right. Thank you, brother.
All right, let me use indigenous. Question is, is there, he wants me to explain the difference between native and indigenous. Is, he asked, is there a deeper meaning to the word uh, native? All right, so let me give indigenous. If I say to you, a certain plant is indigenous to Suriname or Guyana. What does that mean? A particular plant is indigenous to um, Nigeria. So let's use this plant. Let me give you something that you can understand. Let's say so a particular plant, what does that mean? It's naturally what? Produced there. That's its natural inhabitants. All right? So indigenous, natural. I N D I N 2 G E N which is the Greek form and Greek you're looking at origin concept of origin naturally all right so just you want to use indigenous as well all right native Thank you, brother. The, the root word in the word indigenous is G-E-N. Am I talking about the word cognate? C-O-G-N-A-T-E. Cognate. The root word in cognate is G-N. It's a zero-grade form. A zero grade form, it doesn't have a vowel. You have what's called an O grade, where the, a vowel E is trans, it's what? Using um, umlaut, vowel shifts from an E to an O. That's called an O grade form. A zero grade form is where the vowel is removed. So G N. The root word in native. All right? Is it the same family as the root word in the word indigenous? Family. They're cousins. Same family as the root word. All right? Aboriginal. And Rachel Valley wanted me to break this down last year, Aboriginal. And she was saying that people were saying that the, the prefix ad in the word aboriginal means not. And abnormal, and the word abnormal, the prefix ad means not. In the word aboriginal, the prefix ad means from. Abnormal, that means not. So a prefix can function as a negation, as in the word abnormal, the prefix ab is functioning as a negation. But that's not in all cases. You can't take that in all cases. That ab means not in every word. No. All right? So you have aboriginal. Ab means from. You have O-I-R as in the word origin. Also orient. Orientation. All right? The orient is where the place, is where the sun rises. As the word orient, the root, as the word Root word O I R, where the suffix E N T means to rise. 
the Orient. So the rises. The Orient is the East. The Orient is the East. Orientation. Orient yourself. It's the East. All right? G-I-N, a form of G-E-N, not native. Come on, bro. A-L is the prefix, I mean, sorry, suffix. So, produced from or rising from the beginning. Rising from the beginning. The original inhabitants of the land. Rising from the beginning. Ever indigenous. Natural. Natural people of the land. As in, in a, a plant is in, being indigenous to an area. Being naturally produced. All right? The Black Law Dictionary. will define native as you have I mean, all right, let's see. in the Constitution you have two terms native born see what it makes you do <laughs> But I gotta do it. You know I mean, all right, native-born citizen, right? And has what? Natural-born citizen. First, right there, color, color. Hold on, native. Born citizen. They attach native born. All right? So if you go to the origin, look. Point to original. So, um, is Donald Trump native to the land? He was born in there, you know, he was born in the same land mass in the world, all right? Is Hillary Clinton native to the land? I mean, George, George, uh, George Bush Jr., native to the land? They were born here, though. You know how they? That doesn't make Of course not. That doesn't make you, me, or anybody else in here. Of course not. What they also did, brother man, they created the term Native, the Europeans created the term Native American. We have American, in fact, Barack Obama in 1915 uh, signed the Native American November as Native American Month. And the Native American and nineteen the seventeen nineteen seventy four Native American Act. This term the Europeans created this term Native American. They added the word native to the word American. They legislated in nineteen seventy four the Native American Act in 1974. So not only do they create the term, but you created the legislation. Donald Trump, what is the difference between an American or a Native American? Barack Obama, what is the difference between an American? Think about this. Native American Act, hmm. Native American Month, November. What's an American? 1928. 
1828 Webster's Dictionary. I'm sorry, 1828 and also 1936. 1828 Webster's Dictionary defines American as Aboriginal. Top of color. 1936 Webster's New International Dictionary defines an American as an Aboriginal or one of the copper colored natives found on the American continent by the Europeans, the original application of the name. So why did the Europeans create the term Native American and have this Native American Act in 1974? What's the motive? Creating this term Native American. So they, so we think the general public will refer to those on reservations as what? I don't know. What term did they use, though, bro? They use Indian and... No. They don't use, brother, they don't call the people Federal Reserve. Right, come on, come on. No, 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 hit me. I know that's name. This is my question. Uh, my question, though. Stay with me, my question. What does the general public... That Asiatic and European refer to people on the, what name do they use in referring to people on reservation? Indians and what else? Thank you. Thank you. Now, where do you get that from? Where do you get it from? They don't refer to them as Indians, right? I mean, Americans, right? Don't say American, just say Native American. Hmm. And also American Indian. And you use in the race and ethnic standards of federal assistance in military reporting. American Indian. Can someone look up the, the race and ethnic standards? There's five categories. All right, so let's, let me get that. You did this, man. <laughs> now, this is good. I want to explain with you, brother. I'm good. This is good. Because, you know, you've got you to put this in context. You have American Indian slash what? Alaskan Native. Right? Um, is that... No, Mary, no, 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 that's Pacific Islander, Alaskan Native. Yeah, American Indian, right? Alaskan Native slash Pacific Islander. Somebody check this for me. Black. All right, black. Hispanic. Hispanic. Can I look it up for me, please? You got it? That's the five categories? Oh. All right. That's right. Asian. All right. I, I, I was, all right. Asian. All right. Pacific. Let me get this. All right. Island, Islander. Pacific uh, Islander. All right. Black. Hispanic, white, slash Caucasian. This is slash Caucasian. So let's analyze this. I need you to give me the definition for, give me the definition for Native American, I mean for American Indian, that specific island. Give me the definition. American Indian. Give me the definition. American Indian also considered for Alaskan Native. Uh-huh. Oh, those, oh. That's Alaskan Native, that's right. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to read it. I'm gonna have to sit through the guy to stand next to you. Okay. Uh both identification through tribal affiliations or community. Oh, we read it, please. Okay. Oh, let me let me read it because I actually can they can hear me. American Indian or Alaskan Native, 
a person having origins in any of the original peoples of North America and who maintains cultural identification through tribal affiliation or community recognition. Having origins in any of the original peoples of North America sounds like us. Sounds like that definition applies to us. Those are in the city. Definition for black. Black. A person having origins in any of the black racial groups of Africa. Let's go back to the definition of American Indian or National Native. A person having origins in any of the original peoples of North America. Are we claiming that? I'm talking about the definition. I'm about the definition. Are we claiming to be original people of the land? See how they apply that definition to those on reservations? Don't apply the definition to those in inner cities? Social engineering. Language. Social engineering. All right? So there's no need for the term Native American because as what? An American is native to the land. So this, but you know why they did this? To steal your birthright. So they're claiming to be American. You guys thinking that American is one of European descent? A United States citizen? If you were in China or anywhere else, they say, well, and you say, you I'm an American. You say, claim to be an American, which you are. Oh, you're a United States citizen. No, I never said that. I said I'm an American. They're a United States citizen. I never said that. They're one and the same. That's worldwide. Worldwide. And it's a matter of control. LeBron James. I did think about I'm serious. When you walked in, LeBron James came to my mind. <laughs> Family, please look at him. Does she look like it? Is, can it it's not just me. Does she look like LeBron James? Right. Yeah. Well, sure. <laughs> well, brother, for like a second, <laughs> I ain't gonna lie, brother. I, <laughs> LeBron James. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're not here to call him. <laughs> Man, LeBron James is here. Man, he's not class. Yeah, but you look a lot like LeBron James, brother. No doubt. Uh, any questions? Ask me any questions? Yes, sir. Oh, you have a question? Yes, sir. All right. You have a question? Yeah, that's a question, yes, sir. All right. Okay. Those of us that are going to put ourselves out of the footgear, somehow, or we're going to pull ourselves out of the dunce house. Okay. Do you know anything about biochemical engineering? No. You know nothing about biochemical engineering exactly? No. You know anything about the forces of the spiritual realm? Um, you know we have to learn about war military right now. I'm going to read that later, brother. All right, so no, I don't know. I'm not a bio, I mean, you know, because I'm not going to claim that and, and somebody challenge me on it. <laughs> I can't talk about it. That's an excuse. Another question? Yes, sir. 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 All right, I'll move on. Uh, All right, please, I'm asking you. Yeah, well, it's just related to Trump. I think he said he wanted to get uh, somebody that's in Trump to become a good thing in the Indian Uh He's talking about those on reservation? Or those from um, Sindhu, modern day India. Mm-hmm. 
you know, I didn't hear him say that, but I'm trying to, you know, if you know what he's talking about, those from Sendu or those from Reservation. All right. I just, I trust that this helps. <laughs> Just take this help you a little bit. All right, so we're talking about semantics and etymology. So let's look at. Etymology. Let's look at this word nice here. You see the etymological brackets. Right? From the Latin, me, that's the N, E with the make crown above it, plus Sierra to know. And this is what I said in class on uh, Monday. If you go and if you read, I read over, I looked at over a thousand books, linguistic books at the uh, Rutgers University Library and then also Temple University Library. Now the scholars, the European scholars, when, they, when they're talking about etymology, writing about etymology, and addressing the etymology of a, of a word, for example, the word nice, they write, well, the word nice meant Past tense. The word nice meant past tense. In the 1500s, all right, not knowing, not know, stupid, ignorant, all right. Now, the problem I have is that they're using past tense. So you studying these reading these etymology books, they're using past tense. Why not it now it currently means? What's this use of past tense? Why, why no longer means that? And who is setting the agenda for that? Who is setting the agenda that it no longer means stupid or slave no longer means Slavic people or whatever word it is? Who is setting the parameters for that? Who's controlling our way of thinking? Move on right along with this. When you have, let's go back to entry level meaning. You have some scholars and defining the word denotation. Denotation. D E N O A. D E N O T A T I O N. Some scholars will define denotation as established meaning. I was really just trying to remember my lesson I gave Monday. That's why I'm <laughs> now it's coming back to me. Dictionary meaning. Literal meaning. So you have some scholars who define as established meaning, others define it as the dictionary meaning, others define denotation as the literal meaning. All right, my, my question is what is meant by established meaning? 
I ask that question as I'm reading these definitions of denotation by these various authors. What do the authors mean by established meaning? Anyone? What do the authors mean by established meaning? Does the author mean by established meaning the true original meaning? As in the word slave, we have the word slave. All right, here's the word slave. So what does the author mean by established meaning for the word slave, the Slavic people, and Eastern European nationality? What, does, what do the authors mean in defining denotation as established meaning? Something that shall be permanent and accepted by everybody. Something that is permanent and accepted by everybody. How does it become permanent and accepted by everybody? See, you see where I'm going? This lesson here is to get you to think. How does it become permanent and accepted by everybody? The more you use it, the more people get used to it. It becomes, I guess it becomes tradition, it becomes part of your history, it becomes a truth. Because, all right. Because a definition is used by the masses or, and you say everybody, you say that that makes it, it becomes true? Does that make it true? I mean, what, what is the criteria? All right, so you, this is good. Come on, brother. Come on, come on. Just dance with me, brother. Dance with me. All right, if you use it enough, you can get people to agree to it. Now it's a contract, is what I'm saying. Does it make it true? It doesn't make it true. But it All right, so it doesn't make it true. So we both agree there. Right. Because you said it makes, you said true then. You used the word true. I'm just, I'm just questioning you on, does it make it true? So he says no. So it doesn't make it true. All right? Millions of people through social engineering call what you have in your pocket money and dollars. Because many of pe millions of people through social engineering call Federal Reserve notes money and dollars, does it make it money and dollars? What is etymology? The true meaning. All right? Original meaning. So when we talk about true meaning and original, true meaning and meaning. True meaning and meaning. So because it's put into the society and people, but how does it? Right? How does it become accepted? I do a dictionary study, which is called a comparative analysis of dictionaries. I would bring in 20 to 10 different dictionaries from different time periods. And what will you see? And getting, if you look at my oldest dictionary is in 1921 and 1936 and 1940, different Falkland Wagnos. I have American Heritage. I have different Webster's, all right? I have uh, um, Oxford, 1954 Oxford. And I would take a word like slave, dollar, whatever, you know, and I would do a comparative analysis. In the entry level meaning, the entry level meanings are numbered one, two, three, four, five, and I would 
I would analyze the, the definitions and the entry level meaning. And what I observed in doing this, in the older dictionary, the entry level, entry level meaning number one is closer to its etymology. You take that same word, 1921, 1936, 1940, 1950, 1960, 1970, 1980. What you will see done is that the entry-level meaning number one in 1921, 1936, is now in 1940, it becomes what? The last one. 1970 is no longer there. It's a systematic dumb down. It can't be done abruptly. Why? People who were living in the 1920s was walking around with coins in their pockets. You had a society that was aware of silver and gold dollars. It has to be done gradually. Not done abruptly. How does it become the quote unquote established meaning? Talk to me. I think. I gotta stand next to you. Go ahead. Assimilation. Assimilation? I gave an example of that. I gave an example. Missionaries. What a greater way. You got millions of children to go to school. What better way? Dictionary. Resign. <laughs> you know? No <laughs> addition. Not to show, not to read the You know? And, that's, and I said, wow, this is deep. Process. All right? So let's look at. So what they're calling established meaning, ten minutes to? All right, thank you. So we got five minutes, right? Ten, five, all right. What they five, ten minutes? Let's look at dictionary meaning. I gotta move on. All right, dictionary meaning. What is meant by dictionary meaning? In defining denotation, authors define some authors define denotation as the dictionary meaning. What does that mean by that? Well, if you go to, uh, you go to the dictionary, you know, you know, we're gonna look at the entry level meaning. Yeah, slave. Yeah, one who's put in servitude. Yeah, that's a denotation. Yeah, this also defines denotation as a dictionary meaning. Well, I'll give you nice go to nineteen fifty Webster's. 1928, 17, 17 uh, something, uh, Johnson's Dictionary. What dictionary are you talking about? Well, we can't use, we can't use the 17 something Johnson's Dictionary? 1828? What do you, we don't even think on this level, family. This is not even part of our education to even take one as a level. All right? Literal meaning. What does authors mean by literal meaning defining denotation? Well, literal is word for word. The word literal means letter. Word for word. The exact meaning. Word for word. The exact meaning. So what do they mean by literal meaning? Because stupid is a little meaning for word life. Consider to observe the stars carefully is the literal meaning for the word consider. Islamic people, as an Eastern European nationality, is the literal meaning for the word slave. 
You like to be a slave, you have to walk, walk, talk, and make sure we get wiped out. I say, number one, be careful. All right? So just want to look at this. So once again, we have authors who define denotation as established meaning, some who define it, denotation as a dictionary meaning, some who define denotation as a literal meaning. We need to an I analyze. I was just analyzing everything. I was questioning upon questioning upon questioning. And looking at how they define it. What do they mean by established meaning? And we, and we had you and I had a very good discourse on that. All right? All right, so we're going to be ending. Well, Ali, you want to lead us in um, prayer here? All right? Islam. Islam. Allah, Father of the Universe. Father of love. Father of love. Truth, truth, peace, 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 and and justice. Allah is my protector, my guide, guide, and my salvation. salvation. By night night, and by day, through the Holy Prophet, Abu Ali, also known as Sheikh Shamil Abu Ali. Peace and love. That's Ross Rice said, great, great class. <laughs> That's Ross. <laughs> Wake up, everybody, no more sleeping in 